Well, good morning and welcome to Quest Church. My name is Sarah McDonald. I'm the executive pastor here at Quest. And I am so excited that you braved the weather or the potential weather to be here. If you weren't here last week, John preached on Noah. You're welcome. (laughs) But now we need to start building an ark. Uh, with things. It's a little too much with that. But anyways, I am glad that you are here with us. And if you are here from Quest, I am glad you're here. If you are here from Chosen, I am glad you're here. If you are listening online, I am glad that you are here with us. And also, if it is your first or second time here with us, we are especially glad that you decided to be here with us this morning. And I would love for you to fill out one of these orange connect cards located in the seat pockets right in front of you. Simply fill that out. And then when you're leaving worship today, I would love for you to place them on the orange boxes then. Hey, I also want to let you know that if it is, if you've been checking out our church, maybe for the last few weeks or a few months, and you want to kind of know what your next step is, your next step is to join us for Starting Point, which is coming up in just a few weeks on June 23rd. And in this class, all it is is about learning more about Quest and who we are and how you can get more connected. So I would love for you to come join us for that. It's during the 1030 service, so it's perfect. Just come here to the nine and then walk over to our conference room, which is located in the building right next door for that class. You can sign up online and all the details are located in your program today. But again, I would love to see you at that. So hey, we have been in a series this summer, and it's great time for you to come because we're only in the second um, Sunday of this series, but I love summer series because they stand alone here at Quest. So if you missed last week, that's okay, but I really would encourage you to check it out online. But um, we've been talking about different people in the Bible, and specifically heroes in the Bible. Now, what I love about my Bible is that every single person in it minus one is just an ordinary person or very ordinary people that God does extraordinary things through. Now, obviously, that other person is Jesus, and he just came to the world extraordinary, and then God did extraordinary things with it. But if you look through it, it's filled with people that are just like you and I that God does some awesome things through. And so John asked me to speak during the series, like, you can pick anybody you want. And normally, I like that kind of leeway. But it was hard. It was hard because I really wanted to find a person that had a beautiful, easy story. There's not anybody in the Bible that has a beautiful, easy story. And so I kind of toyed around with a lot of different people, and then God kept bringing back this one person. And I literally told God multiple times, no, nope. Nope, 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 because I relate to this person a little too much. And so I did not want to speak on them, and I definitely didn't want to learn anything from them. You ever feel that way about God and about some people in the Bible? And so this person, this person is an amazing woman that is found in the Old Testament. She's amazing, and she is strong. And in fact, she has an entire book of the Bible devoted just to her and her story, And what's crazy about this entire book of the Bible is that God's name is not mentioned not once in it, but yet he is pointed, like everything points to him all along the way. And it's a pretty awesome story. And this person, this person is Esther. Now, for some of you church people, you've literally tuned me out right now because you're like, oh, I know where she's going with this. Hmm, I don't think you do. because I wish that I could go certain places with this. And others of you were like, Esther, that's the name for you. Well, Esther, Esther was this woman that she lived back in the day. Remember we talked about last week how this was in the Old Testament. So this is like a long, long, long time ago. And things were a lot different back then for women especially. But Esther found herself, she was an orphan. And so her mom and her dad had both died and she was being raised by her uncle Mordecai. Now, When I'm sharing this story to you, if you are pregnant and you do not have a name picked out for your child, I got you covered on this. Mordecai is one of them. You're welcome. The next kid we're going to put up here on the screen, I just know it's going to say Mordecai up there for things. We'll have to show a baby. But in this story, Esther finds herself in quite a predicament. And so I'm going to kind of walk you through the story because if you've never heard it, You need to know all the details. And if you have heard it before, I think we kind of glance over, we kind of skip over some of the key parts. So I'm going to give you the quick notes version of Esther, okay? But here's your homework, and we'll come right off that. You need to read the book of Esther. It is several chapters long. It is like the best novel you could ever read. So if you're looking for everybody needs summer reading lists, 
add this to your summer reading list. It is the book of Esther. Because this whole entire book shares her story and shares her past and all along the way. And so Esther, Esther is living her own life. Things are fine. She's living with Mordecai. It's a simple, ordinary life. And at the time, there's a king named Xerxes. Okay, there's another one for you. Xerxes had a queen. And this queen was beautiful. She was so beautiful that the king says, I know what I want to do. I want to show her off to everybody. So I want to make her wear her fancy crown and like pretty much parade her around town. Well, this queen says one small little word that would get her in a lot of trouble. She said, no. Now, you have to know back then that a woman's place was very, very low for social class and the hierarchy, all that. She was down here. The man was up here. And so you definitely did not tell a man no. You most definitely didn't tell your husband no. And you for sure didn't tell the king no. And so when this happened, everybody was like, ooh, Xerxes, you better make an example out of her. You better make sure that everybody knows their place. And so he sends out this whole decree that's literally telling all of the ladies, all the, like, that you will do exactly what your husband tells you to do. Men, that is not the sermon today. Okay, just so we're clear, some of y'all have tuned me out from that point. They're going to be like, Sarah said this. No, that is not it. So this whole decree goes out, and then he banishes the queen from the courts, from everywhere. She is exiled at this point in time. So things were not looking good for her because she stood up for herself and said that one little word of no. And so a king cannot be without a queen. And so he goes out, not him, but he sends people out to go find the most beautiful women in all the land. It almost sounds like a fairy tale with that. And brings them to this place. And Esther is one of them because it says in there that she was beautiful. And there was also something about her that set her apart. And so she was brought in with all of these other women, and they were dying. They had all the best food and wine and jewelry and clothing and all of that. And then she was selected to be the next queen. Life was good, right? I'm like, I could be in the palace. I could handle that kind of life for a little bit, not having to worry about anything, not having to do anything. And a lot of times, we like to look into other people's lives and say, oh, I wish I could do that. Oh, see, if I was just her, life would be okay. But see, the part of the story that I left out is how she was selected to be the queen. You see, basically, they were a part of a harem. They were sent in. They were basically prostitutes to be able to pick, for the king to pick which one was best for him. You see, her life wasn't as great as they all thought it was. And I think a lot of times we let other people's we compare ourselves to other people, and we let that rob ourselves of our joy with things. But Esther made the most of her situation. I'm sure things were great once she got into the palace. And things were going well, and Mordecai, her uncle, even has a position in the courts, and so things were good. But then this little thing happens, because here's your drama part of things, is that Mordecai will not bow down to this new guy in charge called Haman. And so he refuses that, so Haman goes, I cannot have that. And so I'm going to figure out a way to get rid of him, but I can't just get rid of him. So i got to come up with a plan for it. And so he decides that he's going to convince the king to destroy all the Jews. Now, here is something that I haven't told you yet. Esther is a Jew. Mordecai is a Jew. Now, nobody knows that yet, but because Haman gets so angry about things, he starts investigating a little and goes, ah, this is how I'll get rid of him. I'll just say we're going to destroy all the Jews, and then Mordecai's taken care of, and everybody will think I'm great. So he convinces the king to do this, and Mordecai and the Jews are just distraught because now a decree has come out to all the land that they will all be destroyed. And the crazy part that I learned is they're going to be destroyed in a year. Like they put a decree out in April and said, hey, in March of next year, everybody's going to die. Could you imagine? Could you imagine me telling you right now, hey, everybody in here, we're all going to die in a year. Like, live your life. Go by. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know what we would do if you knew that. And so there, this, this anxiety, this, I mean, could you imagine what they're going through? And so Mordecai is literally in mourning. Like, he's wearing mourning clothes. He's mourning. And Esther's, like, looking out there, and she's going, like, what is happening with him? Is he completely crazy? Like, what is going on? 
And so this is kind of where we pick up in the story because Esther can't just run down to go talk to him because she's the queen. Now she can't just talk with that. And so she's going to kind of work through Hathak, another good name for you. Um, She's going to work through him to kind of figure out what's going on. And so here's where we pick up um, in the story. And so we're in Esther chapter 4, verses 6 through 17. And it says this. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the square in front of the palace gate. Mordecai told him the whole story, including the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Like, here's all the facts. Okay, I've got everything lined up with this. And then he also gave him a copy of the decree issued in Susa that called for the death of all the Jews. He asked Hathak to show it to Esther and explain the whole situation to her. He also asked Hathak to direct her to go to the king to beg for mercy and plead for her people. I mean, it sounds like a pretty good plan. So Hathak returned to Esther with Mordecai's message. And here's how she responds. Then Esther told Hathak to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. Think about it like text messaging back and forth. Except for this is she's having to actually go through a messenger. She says, all the king's officials and even the people in the provinces, like everybody knows, Mordecai, that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter and the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days. Like, and if it's not bad enough, like I haven't even seen him in 30 days. It's not like we're passing in the hallways to be able to see each other. So Hathak gave Esther's message to Mordecai and then Mordecai responds back with this. Don't think for a moment that because you're up there in that palace that you will escape when all the other Jews are killed. For if you keep quiet, At a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives, you will die. For who knows if perhaps you're made queen for just such a time as this. And then Mordecai does this. So she sends it back to Mordecai and says, okay, here's the plan. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it's against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I die, I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything Esther had ordered him. Now, this is important because I'm like, what is one of the main things we can get from Esther with this? There's a lot of things. But the main one is, I think she did a great job when a storm came her way how she handled herself when she had to make a really big decision. She handled herself well, because I'm going to tell you what I would have done. I've been like, oh, that sucks. <laughs> um, but I'm, I think I might be okay up here. I mean, the king kind of likes me, and so I might get a pass. And you know what? Maybe, I, I mean, I'll pray. I'll pray for you. I'll pray that he changes his mind. And, or, you know what? We got a year. Like, we don't have to decide anything right now. But that's not what Esther did because, you see, she did three main things. And this is what I think that we can really take from this. It's one of the first things she said at the end of that is she said, okay, you know what? We're going to fast and we're going to pray. She said that very clearly. She said, okay, this is the first thing that I'm going to do. Before coming up with the whole plan, before doing all this, we need to fast and we need to pray. And fasting is literally what they was said. It was taking away from food and water, not having that. They were pretty intense. Sometimes we do fasting and we still have water and stuff around there. She literally says, like, this is so serious for three days, no food, no drink. Because when you have that, when you have hunger pains, when you have all that, that's when you're more in tune with God. That's when you're really relying on God for all sustenance, for everything. It's a deeper, it's a spiritual discipline to be able to fast. And she said, this is the time that we need to be fasting and we need to be praying and really listen to see what God wants us to do. And then here's what I love is that she didn't just do it herself. The second thing she did is she included others. She included a community of people. Because if you said that, she's telling Mordecai, I need you to call all the Jews, all the believers, and they need to be fasting and praying. She didn't say, I'm going to get my new friends in the palace. I'm going to get the ones that like me, the ones that are going to tell me what I want to hear. I will bring all them in to pray for me. No, she wanted the believers because here's what I know in my life. When I need to make a big decision, 
really when I need to make any decision. But when I need to make those big decisions on things, I need other people that are going to pray for me. And maybe you're like me, and I can have two camps of friends. I have one that I'll send a text message to, and I'm like, hey, pray for me. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, eh, it's like a 50-50 chance if it happened. And I have another group of people, and it's a smaller group, that I know when I send a message that says, please pray for me, that they are literally on their knees interceding for me, not just that day, but until I make a decision. Friends, you need those kind of people in your life. You need those kind of people in your life that when you're about to make the wrong decision, that they go, oh, no, 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 you need to stop. Because God literally told me you need to stop. I need that in my life. And I also need those people going like, yes, I've been praying for this and I feel like you are right in tune with what God's telling you to do. I need that confirmation with things. But I'm gonna tell you this, just by coming to church, you're not gonna instantly get that group of people. You've gotta do the work to be able to go out and meet people and be in community with them and understand their lives. They understand your lives. And then here's the other thing. When somebody says, will you pray for me? You gotta do it too. You have to have that spiritual discipline as well, but you need these people in your life because I believe that Esther could not have made this decision and this plan without knowing she had a backing of believers that were praying for her. And then the last thing Esther did was she had a plan. After she did all these things, she came up with a plan and I haven't told you the plan yet. And this might be why I like Esther a lot um, because she has a plan. And y'all know that um, if you know me, I love plans. I love a lot of plans um, with things. That whole plan B series was rough um, for me because I have plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G um, on things. But she comes up with a plan. But here's what I think we need to learn from her is she took the next step. She didn't just say, we're going to pray and we're going to pray and we're going to pray and we're going to pray. And a year goes by and then maybe we'll do something. She literally heard God speak. She knew what she needed to do and then she acted on it. You see, faith requires action. And what I loved is even a few weeks ago, Unique was preaching. He literally said, some of us need to stop praying and start doing what God's already told you to do. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what it is. Some of us are still going like, I just want to stay in this comfort zone of just praying about it and thinking about it. And it's harder to actually make the plan and do it. But Esther did it. And I'm so glad she did because she came up with a very detailed plan and it worked. Because you see, my simple plan would have been like, okay, I'm going to get all dressed up. Like I was talking to Matt about this. I was like, if you were really mad at me and I really had to have a conversation with you, I would probably wear like the outfit that you liked the most and like jewelry and like do my makeup and like all this and maybe like fix your favorite meal, like something just so I could like see you, right? So Esther could have gotten like all dolled up and been like, maybe the king will come to me and then we can have a conversation. That's kind of the easiest plan. I think her plan was like, I mean, it was elaborate. She had this whole plan that's like, okay, I need to get Haman at the table and I need to get the king at the table. And then so I can talk. So she plans this whole thing to kind of like build up Haman because that's, he'll surely show up. And there's a celebration in his honor. And then she's like, I mean, she's moving all these pieces around. Women, don't we do that sometimes? Like trying to get everybody at the table and they all think it's their idea with things. Um, she's real good at that. So she gets them all at the table. And then she's able to tell them, she's able to tell the king, like, you've been tricked. And actually, Haman is the one that did all of this. And you're about to kill a whole bunch of people that you really didn't need to kill. And so the king doesn't like that he's been tricked. And so he sends Haman off and Haman's to be killed. And he sends out another decree that tells the Jews that they can fight for themselves a year from now. So they have the time to defend themselves. So literally her people are saved because she had this plan and it worked. But here's what I love about God and what I love about Esther is God literally used everything about her to accomplish this plan. Everything about her, even the things that she didn't like about herself, even the things she could have used as an excuse about herself. Like, okay, God, um, in case you didn't know, um, I'm a woman and that's not good in this situation. Or did you know that, I mean, I'm a Jew, I'm who he wants to kill. Like, this doesn't kind of work out. He, but God used all of that. He used the things that she thought were a weakness. She used them as strengths. You see, so many times, and I think we as women do this, ooh, a lot, is we go, God, why did you make me this way? 
why did you give me this? Why did you give me that? Why did you give me anxiety when then I have to talk to people? Why did you make me an introvert and then you put me on a stage? Why did you X, Y, and Z? We come up with all these things and we get so wrapped up in what we think we're not. Then God goes, don't you know that I created you just like this for a reason? You see, God took everything that Esther was and he did amazing and big things through her because she was able to see all those things as strengths so that when God had a plan for her, she was able to use all of those. And I believe that that is what he's calling us to do today because what happens is when we get so preoccupied with ourself, we don't see the bigger picture. And now pride comes in two different ways. Pride also comes when you're thinking about yourself too much, even if it's in the negative. And so when you're constantly thinking, I'm not good enough, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not this, you're thinking about yourself and you're losing sight of the bigger picture. Now, pride also comes when you think too highly of yourself, too. You can't see the bigger picture because what I know happens a lot is that sometimes we become so preoccupied with the position that we're in that we forget that there's a main purpose out there, that there's something bigger happening along the way. But then what I also know happens, and I fall into this category ooh, a lot, is that we get so preoccupied with trying, to, we miss the whole point, y'all. We miss the point that we are in a position for such a time as this and that we really don't even have to understand what the purpose is. Because what I believe that Esther is telling us what she would shout from the mountaintops is that we need to trust in the position even when we don't fully understand the purpose. Now, let me explain this because I'm going to say it again. We need to trust in the position even when we don't fully understand the purpose. Some of us are in a position right now that you are like, you do not know the kind of position that I am in right now. You do not know that I've been fighting for my marriage for 10 years and tomorrow I sign divorce papers. And Sarah, I need to know the purpose. Some of you are struggling with addictions that you were literally hung over from from last night and you were like, right now I am struggling and I need to know the purpose of this. There are some of you sitting next to that person that had that kind of night and you were like, I've been dealing with this family member, this friend, this loved one with this addiction for years. Please tell me why I'm in this position because I need to know the purpose. Some of you wake up every single day to a job that you don't like, that you are struggling, struggling with, you don't even want to get up each day and you go, I need to understand that purpose of why I'm in this position. But friends, if you are a believer in Christ, if you are a Christ follower, you know what the purpose is. You know the purpose. You know the truths that say he works everything out for good for those that love him or are called according to his purpose. You know that he's going to finish the good works that he started in you. You know the purpose. We just want to know what's in it for me. We want to know, how do I come out? If I'm working this job, will I be a millionaire in 20 years? That's what I want to know. And see, when I say it that way, you go like, well, that sounds selfish. Yeah, sometimes it kind of is. Because here's the thing. What if you're in this place, this position that you're in, and it's not to benefit you at all? What if you're in this position so that you would trust in God and serve him through it? What if you got nothing out of it and he got everything in it? Because here's what I know is that I have watched people in my life go through literally what I would call hell on earth. I have watched them be in positions that I don't dare wish on anybody. But man, they impacted my life when they were going through it. Because why? Because they served God in the midst of it. And yes, through it, they did get something out of it. Y'all know what I'm saying. I'm not saying you don't get, you're not better by it or like we're stronger with God and all of that. But they didn't sit there in that place and go like, well, since I'm not going to get anything out of this, I'm just going to hang out here. They could see the bigger picture, but they weren't consumed with that. They were consumed with trusting in the position that they were in. And here's the thing. The reason we don't like that. It's because what that really means is we got to release all security and we got to release all control. Now, um, stop laughing, John. Stop <laughs> laughing. The reason I cannot trust the position so many times is I am a control freak. 
I love to have all the control and I love to have all the security of things. I love my comforts. And so, so many times I cannot trust the position at all. But when I'm saying that, I'm really saying, God, because I don't trust you. And so I've got to be able to relinquish that security. And so you're thinking, that's risky. Oh, yeah, it's risky. Do you think what Esther did was risky? Yeah, she literally risked her life for it. And she said, God, I put my security in you and in you alone. And that's when amazing things happen. You know, we joke around in staff meetings and staff prayer. We do that every other week, and it was about a month ago. I literally was sharing with the staff. I'm like, I don't understand why God keeps changing things in my life, and I have no control over them. And John literally laughed, just like you did just now, with it, in a good way, because he goes, Sarah, God's going to keep putting you in this position. Until when? Until you relinquish that control and that security. Because here's what I know, friends, in the position that I am currently in right now, if I don't get it here, I'm just going to move on to another position. And guess what? It might look different, but it's still the same. So until I can, and I can only fix me, I'm the only one that can give that up. So until I can do that, when I move to the next position, that can look at it differently and see it differently. But friends, we've got to give up that security and that control because I'm telling you, he's going to keep bringing it back to you until you get it. And you'll see that happen time after time and time again because I need to stop having my security and my comforts And my security needs to be on him and him alone. Now, here's what's comforting to me is that there was another group of people in the Bible that they struggled with this. They struggled with trusting the position when they didn't really have a clue what the purpose was with things. And this group of people were the disciples. And the disciples were Jesus' close friends. He hung out with them all the time. He told them everything. Guys, Jesus told them the purpose. Jesus told it over and over and over again, but they still did not understand it. And even in his last days, he's sitting with them and he's telling them again, hey, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. It's better for you that I leave. I'm sending you somebody. He's telling them the whole great plan. And they're still like, no, 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 no. I do not like this. Don't do it. They didn't get it. But Jesus, he was so patient, y'all. He was so patient with them and he is so patient with us because I believe that he is saying this to us today. And this comes from John 13, 7. So if you're struggling right now, I want you to hear these words of Jesus when you're trying to trust in this position, even when you don't fully get the rest. And he says this, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday, someday you will. You can literally insert your name, Sarah. I know you don't understand why I put you here. I know you don't. I know you wish there was an easy button to push. I know that you wish you could just sneak on out of this. I know. But someday you will understand. And friends, we may not understand while we're even here on earth. It might be that we literally were at Jesus and we're like, oh, now I see. But what he's telling us to do is he's saying, Sarah, would you trust in the position that you are in? Because if you can trust in that and in that position, if you would do what Esther did, if you would fast, if you would pray, if you would bring in other people, and then if you would make a plan and go with it, then I can do extraordinary things with it if you would just trust in me. I wanted to leave you guys with a visual of kind of how I think this looks. And so um, I told Wes to find me a picture of stepping stones. Um, So I'm gonna put this up here. But I was like, but I don't want like total serene looking um, stepping stones because this is what I believe in. The position that you're in, you are standing on one of those stepping stones because God's trying to get you from here to here. From here where you were to your purpose that's over here. And there are stepping stones in between. And so right now you are standing on a stepping stone. Your position is on this stone. And for some of you, It's a nice smooth stone and it's kind of sturdy, like one of those. And you were like, I like where I'm at right now. You're kind of scaring me on things. I believe that he gives us reprieve and he puts us in those kind of places. Some of you are standing on a stone that you were like, it is so wobbly. I could fall in at any moment in time. Some of you are about to step onto a stone that it looks steady, 
but when you step on it, it is super rocky along the way. What I know is that he's saying, would you stand in that position? Would you stand on that rock? And friends, the rock is Christ. He has put you in that position for a reason, for such a time as this, but he's saying, would you trust me in it? Would you serve me in it? Would you quit looking at yourself and start looking at me? Because that's what he did with Esther, guys. He did that. She said, okay, it's about something way bigger than me. If I must die, I must die. And when she did that, y'all, she saved people. Friends, today, people's lives are still at stake. And isn't it crazy that he can take the position that you have right now, the position that you don't even like that you're in, and he could save lives through it. And then when you put it like that, all we have to do is trust. All we have to do is trust. Because what I know is when I move to that next position, if I haven't trusted, I haven't given up that security, I'm gonna land back in it again. And I will tell you this, I wanna help get that rock a little sturdier. And if I plant my feet on the rock of Christ and his word and his promises, that's when I am stronger, that's when I see things as strengths, and that's when God uses me to do some amazing things. Friends, we might feel ordinary. We might feel that the position we are in is way bigger than us. But what I know, I know from all the stories of scripture and from the stories of even y'all's lives is that God says, I can use that. In fact, that's when I want to use it. So why don't you open up your arms today and go, okay, God, I trust you. I'm relinquishing control. I'm relinquishing security. As scary as that sounds, God, I'm putting it all in you. Use this position. God, I pray that wherever I'm in right now, that I would serve you in it. And that God, at the end of the day, that you would get everything out of it. Because friends, then, whenever that time comes and you can look back on it, you can go, whoa, I see what you were doing, God. I see what you're doing. And man, thanks for letting me be a part of that. Because friends, he can do it. He continues to do it. This isn't just a story about Esther. This is a story about us. How he still wants to use us. How he still can use us on the sturdy rocks and on the wobbly ones. He uses us all the same. Let's pray together.